we identified all of the the people or the headstones of people buried here in the cemetery and we numbered them and we made a list a database and that's of great use to anybody who might be doing family history right now um, I should explain that about this obviously is a cemetery that's self-evident but it's actually a cemetery on top of a cemetery because originally the monks from the famous monastery uh, would have been buried here but over time um, soil was put on top of all of that so now they had ground to make a second cemetery now it's both catholic and protestant and no religion and any other religion right now we were new we were volunteers but a member of the Wexford Lions Club luckily was a historian and she was able to train <coughs> half a dozen of us to bring people around and show them um, what was there right so I am not an expert I just have been told so you'll just have to believe whatever I tell you right? <laughs> but anyway so we saw this we cleared the ground and we saw there were broken tombstones and all sorts of things and in our ignorance or innocence we thought well we look at this one and we say right well a couple of strong men will just prop it up <laughs> right a bit of cement concrete and that will be fixed and along came the archaeologist and said sorry this is a national monument you must leave it as you find it mm. and then she disappeared for 10 years <laughs> in the meantime <laughs> seeing as she wasn't looking strong men pick up the headstone take its photograph and put it back down again right now that allowed us to find out who was buried there mm. and a whole lot of other similar situations right mm -hmm. most of which we managed somehow or another to to identify some some we did right so we'll go uh, through this way if you like to follow me Right, so here, here we are in, uh, in what remains of Selsker Abbey. Now, you might wonder about the name Selsker. Uh, it comes from two Viking words. One is Sel and the other is Scar. And uh, what did I say? Sel and Scar. Seal. Yeah, Sel and Scar. One means seal, as in sea lion, right? and the other is a rock. Now you might say, what is the connection? And the connection is this, that in medieval times, the, the sea or the river was very much closer to us here than it is now. And Wexford Harbour is full of seals. And at the time, there would have been a lot of rocky precipices, and seals would come up and lie in the sunshine. So this area, had a name for seals, so it made sense. Now, other people say that that is not the correct understanding, that it comes from the word sepulchre and various other different versions, but we're happy with the, uh, with the seal one, right? So, Selsker Abbey. So, <clears throat> so, this abbey that we're standing, the church of the abbey, right, the, the monastery, remember, was over there, um, was built in 1190 and it's what's known as a double nave you can see I'm standing in one nave and that's the other nave right and it's followed by a chancel 
which goes all the way down to the end of the cemetery. Now, sadly, very little remains of this. Um, some of that is due to the tree. Uh, the, the wall that used to be there has fallen apart over the years because of the roots of the tree. Mm -hmm. However, the Augustinians had this monastery and church from 1190 all the way up to 1540. Now, it's about, without doing the sum, I can tell you, it's about 350 years. And in 1540, Henry VIII, King of England, decided that things were going to change and he was going to take all the monasteries away. And the same thing applied to Ireland. So Selsker Abbey was closed down in the 1540s. <clears throat> the monks who were here at the time, most of them went to join other monasteries uh, in Europe. A few remained who were happy to accept that Henry was the head of the church and the rest retired and went over the hill. So in 1540, the key was turned and nothing has happened here since. At least nothing of a religious nature. Now, if you'd like to follow me over to the uh, other corner, I'll show you. It might just help you understand what this is all about. <coughs> You, you can see, uh, looking up, that there are two windows, and the two windows are obviously different, but we have no, we have no answer to the question as to why. Although there was an archaeologist here the other day, and he was saying that in fact that one is so different because this one was actually badly damaged and was very badly repaired. But that's just not another person's opinion. Um, the pillars that supported the roof, if you look at them, you see that they're all different. Mm -hmm. we, we don't know why. But in order to help people understand a bit, we had some uh, architectural design people come and do a plan of what it might have looked like. So you can see the roof of the two naves and the chancel. Now, and the chancel ran the whole way down to the end of the cemetery. Okay. And in the middle is the tower. Now the tower was not built with the church. The church was built, remember, in about 1190. Mm -hmm. The tower wasn't built until 1400. And the reason for the tower being built was that monasteries became very wealthy. People gave them a lot of land, right? And although the monks individually weren't wealthy, together the communities were very wealthy. And in the event of an attack, they would take the valuables, go up into the tower, pull up the ladder, and they were reasonably safe. So that was a defensive tower. Okay. And one of the things about that tower is Although it's built from more or less the same stone, you can see, with the exception of the corners. And if you look at the corners of the tower, mm -hmm. you'll see a sort of a yellowish stone. Yeah. And that's what's called Dundry stone. Now, Dundry stone is actually uh, comes from a quarry in Bristol, in England. And it would have been brought over here by ship, because at the time there would have been a lot of shipping between Bristol and Wexford. So it's easier, uh, it's easier to, to shape. So it's suitable for corners and angles and so forth. So that's Dundry so stone. And you see it surrounds the windows as well. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that Dundry stone was used at the time right up the, the, uh, right up the country. And you'd find it up in the Boyne Valley, wherever there was a river, because they could transport it so easily on a barge. So that's the Dundry stone. Now, on top of the window, if you look very carefully, that little window up there, you might just be able to see a funny little face. Just over the window. Anyway, don't strain your eyes because I have a photograph of this <laughs> and you can just have a look, right? <laughs> and these, these are the little faces that are up there. 
right? And um, right. and they're, they're known as gruesome, and they are to ward off evil spirits. So remember that although this would have been a Christian church, they were hedging their bets just in case, and that's what the, that's what they were for. Now. Um, these medieval churches were all made to the same plan, with the altar placed with its back to the rising sun. So always the eastern wall. We know obviously this is the southern wall where the entrance would have been. Mm -hmm. And if you look backwards, you'll see here a picture of what remained in 1820. So this wall still exists and that's that's where the entrance was, where that big step is, right? Mm -hmm. And you can also see behind the tower a piece of another building. And the other building is the section of the church that went all the way down to the end of the cemetery. Now, it's not there anymore. And the reason why it's not there anymore <coughs> is because, remember, in 1540, this became, began to become a ruin. And people came along and said, ah, I could use some of those stones in my house. Mm -hmm. So you took some and he took some and in time an awful lot of it was gone. But anyway, the remains of that section were still there in 1820 when the Church of Ireland in Wexford needed to build a second church. Their, their main one is on the main street and it's a place that you can visit. It's a very interesting place, St. Iberius. Anyway, the council gave them the land and gave them permission to knock this down. Now that would never happen nowadays because now we would be busy preserving ancient monuments but that's what happened. Uh, so that red sandstone business only dates from 1826. So it's only the other day you might say, right? Anyway, that was the eastern wall, this is the south. This obviously is the west with two big windows. And finally, the north wall. We know that the baptismal font will have been somewhere in this area here. And the reason why we know that is that in medieval times, it always was close to the northern wall and beside it would be a doorway. And the reason for the doorway was that at the moment of baptism, the devil could escape. And that's how he got out. So that's what the doorway there is all about. Anyway, here we are within the church. And um, as you can see, some people have been buried here. Now, in order to be buried inside the church, you had to be either wealthy or influential, or both. So uh, the rest of us were out in the rain, all right? But just to show you a few examples, there's one over here. <laughs> now this, this, uh, this tomb here is very, very unusual. There are two others in the county, right? And it's called a sarcophagus grave. And it comes from two Greek words, one being bones and the other to eat. And it sort of makes sense. But what would happen, and uh, sometimes when we have some children visiting, they find this very interesting because they, they enjoy the gruesome, right? Um, the person, when the person dies, their, their vital organs are removed, they're wrapped up and they're put into the box, right? And the lid is put on top, right? And that's the end of it. But if you look closely, you'll see there's a hole, <coughs> right? Now, without putting too fine a point on it, the reason for the hole is to allow the juices to go down into the soil. And if the hole wasn't there, the lid, gases would build up and the lid would explode. Right? So that's what that's about. But, of course, no lid, no body. Who? We don't know. But maybe we can tell you by looking over here. So...
Now, we, we, we don't know this for a fact. We, we are just told that this is probably the explanation. But a couple of hundred years ago, this was picked up somewhere, presumably over there, right? And rather than have more damage done to it, it was put in the wall, right? And it looks as if there was a face or something there, and there's some sort of shape very hard to know, right? The historians measured, and they accept that it would fit. It's the, so it's the right size for the lid. But that doesn't tell you who the person was. So luckily for us, in the 19th century, there was a Frenchman called De Noyer, and he came to England and to Ireland, and he went to seminaries, and he did rubbings of gravestones. And luckily for us, he did this one. He did this one here. And as you can see, there's a face. And there's also what looks like a ship. If anybody can see it, right? Now, so not only is it there, but this was put beside this. Because this is the family, two family, coat of arms, one Stafford, family called Stafford and the other called Sutton. And we know that a Richard Stafford married an Anne Sutton in 1623. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty sure that that is, in fact, was the person who was there, right? Where the bones are, I'm afraid, we don't know. But we do know that Richard Stafford was the mayor of Wexford. And so hence his influence to be buried here in, in town. And the symbol of the ship the Staffords were into shipping and are still in shipping, right? <laughs> Despite the many, many years in between. So, one or two other interesting sto uh Sorry, excuse me. Headstone. Uh, those of you who are from Ireland uh, will know that in 1169 uh, the Normans came to Ireland, right, with Strongbow. And it took us a very long time to get rid of them, right? And we tried many, many times and we were unsuccessful many, many times, right? But during one of the attempts, which was almost successful, in 1798. It was very successful in Wexford town. The whole country was supposed to rise up, but somehow or another most of the country didn't get the email or the text or whatever <laughs> it was they should have got, and it just didn't happen. But it did happen in Wexford, and the rebels took the town and imprisoned um, <coughs> huge numbers of the influential landowning classes. Now, uh, sadly, it ended very badly. They took the town and they held it for three weeks and they actually declared a republic. Now, remember this is 1798. Two other famous revolutions have only recently uh, taken place and the thinking behind this revolution was very much the thinking of the French and Americans uh, revolutions, right? And the symbols were even the same. Anyway, at the end of three weeks, the Crown forces were on the way uh, to put things back the way they used to be. And the rebels knew that the battle to decide all of this was going to be up the river in Enniscorthy. It's about 11 miles away. And most of the rebels were sent up to Enniscorthy to take part. But some were left here in charge of the prison. And sadly, as is sometimes the case in Ireland, drink was taken and things got out of hand and there were scores to be settled and some of them went into the prison and they took out 90 people, innocent victims, and hanged them on Wexford Bridge. Now, this was a terrible atrocity and sadly, atrocities are happening uh, as we speak. Um, and this man here, 
was an innocent victim. He was one of those, a man called William Daniels. He was a surveyor and he lived here in Wexford Town with his family. Now, three days later, the Crown forces arrived, retook the town and hanged a similar number of people on the same bridge. Now, another atrocity. Now, well, if you the go... Old bridge that's down the river, is it? Hmm? That's the old bridge that's further up the estuary. The, the it's, it would have been. It would have been, yeah. But on the current bridge, if you go to the current bridge, there is a plaque to commemorate these two atrocities, one on either side. And although they were, I mean, undeniably atrocities, uh, the rector of the Church of Ireland, remember most of the people in the original one were Protestant landowners, right? <coughs> and probably most of the rebels tended to be Catholic, but not all by any means. There were also many Protestants on the rebel side. But uh, the clergy on both occasions tried to stop the two sets of hangings unsuccessfully. But anyway, the rector of the church